years back, Tricycle would have a feature where they would ask people about different questions relating to their practice of Buddhism. One of the questions was, do you have enough money? And one of the answers came back is, money is not so much the problem. The problem is I don't have enough time. Human life has always been short, even though life expectancy is longer now. We seem to have less time than people in the past, though, because there's so many more things to do. The typical picture of someone is someone on the phone talking at the same time they're checking their emails, doing three or four things all at once. And still, all the work doesn't get done, which promotes an attitude of sloppiness and isn't doing good enough, whatever passes. I'm not putting out any more effort than that. And the problem is that you live your life that way, the attitude tends to spread to other things as well. It gets into the practice of meditation. It becomes one more thing you do while you're multitasking. You read about people meditating while they're jogging or they're on the exercise machine. Everything becomes something that's multitasked with something else. When it happens to meditation, though, you're missing one of the important qualities. Jitta, which just means giving your whole mind to this, giving your whole heart to this. There are lots of words the Buddha uses to give this quality. In the practice of mindfulness, it's ardency. When he talks about the qualities that he brought to us, Awakening was a resolution along with ardency and heedfulness. Realizing that some things are more important than others, some things, some dangers inside and out are more important than others, more dangerous than others. You've got to prepare. The big one, of course, is death. It may seem far away, but it's very, very close. You look at your breath. The breath is right here, but someday it's not going to be here. Then you don't know how many more breaths you have. The same with your heart. It just keeps ticking away, beating away. But we know that someday it's going to stop, but you don't know when. So it's something you really do have to prepare for. This is one of those cases where you have to remember that things that are pressing are not necessarily important. So even though your day-to-day -day work may be pressing in on you, You've got to realize that your well-being, the well-being of your mind, the well-being of your, your future, is much more important than the work that other people press on you. It's easy to forget that, which is why mindfulness is such an essential part of the practice. You remember things, part of which is you remember the long term. Sometimes you have to sacrifice things in the short term for the sake of the long term. So wisdom lies in having some priorities. That's what's important. There's that saying, everything worth doing is worth doing well, which is not quite the case. Some things it's okay that you just do just good enough, so that you will have time to do the things that are more important. My brother, when he was getting his degree in, Master's business was shocked and when he went to his first week of classes to realize that they were giving him more work than any human being could possibly do, even if that human being did not stop to eat or sleep during the course of the semester. But he was wise enough to realize that the professors knew what they were doing. They're making the student choose, learn to figure out what's important, what's not important. what things you have to let slide so you can focus on the really important things. And the state of your mind is the important thing in life, because if that's spoiled, then everything else gets spoiled. You don't have to wait for death for that to be sure. So 
So meditation is one of those things that demands top priority and that you do it well. They did a study one time of people who have mastered skills, and they discovered that the difference between people who are simply good at a skill and people who really excelled at the skill was that the ones who excelled had a strong sense of the dangers that came from not re really mastering the skill. And also a strong sense of the benefits that come from mastering the skill. And so do what you can to reflect on why this is important. A visit to an old folks home can often be helpful, especially when you see people who are not quite there anymore or incapacity in all kinds of ways. And this is what the human body does. It wears down like this. When you look at an old person like that, you've got to see, this could be me. That was the Buddha's reflection that got him on the path to awakening. He said, thinking about being a young person and a healthy person, and young people and healthy people tend to look down on old people and sick people. But he says, wait a minute, that's, that's going to be me someday. This is not appropriate. You wonder, is there something that is ageless and deathless? So I set out to find it. Near had been raised in a very luxurious, very comfortable environment. And yet he saw the danger. So if you don't see the danger in your comfortable environment right now, visit a place with a lot of old, sick people. I had a strong lesson in this several years back. I was a John Fuang's attendant, and I was around him for all those years when he was sick. And then after he died, I came back home to visit my father, who was also sick at the time. And the contrast between the two was really striking. My father was a very large, strong man, but the illness laid him low emotionally. And it wasn't nearly as severe as a John Fuang's, whereas a John Fuang he had had the training, so the illness, even though it was a very strong illness, didn't conquer his mind. There I drove home the fact that the training does make a difference. We live in a world often, often where doing the job just okay doesn't seem to be very different from doing it really well. When it comes to the well-being of your mind, your ability to face aging, illness, and death, your ability to face difficult situations as they come up, that really does make a difference. And here's your chance to develop qualities of mindfulness, alertness, ardency. Because it's not going to always be the case that you have the opportunity to sit here with your eyes closed and have no other responsibilities. There's a Dharma talk where one of the few Dharma talks that was about John Fuang's that was recorded, where he makes just this point. We don't know how much time we have, but we do know that we have this time. What was especially poignant about it was soon after he gave that Dharma talk, he got very sick. And only a few years after that, he died. And a lot of the people listening to that talk are dead as well right now. So the same happens to us. We listen to this talk, someday I'm going to be dead, someday you're going to be dead. What matters is what we do in the meantime, how we use our time. There's not that much time. So we want to divvy it up. So. The time spent meditating, the time spent developing good qualities in the mind, it doesn't get fritted away. Or even worse, when you do have the time to practice and you're just too lazy. Think about the horse and the whip. Do you want to be the kind of horse that runs only when the whip goes to the bone, or do you want a little bit quicker on the picking up the idea that you've got to run, realizing that running here is good. 
training the mind, developing good qualities that you can depend on. So when things outside start falling apart, things in the body start falling apart, you've got something in the mind that does not fall apart. Lots of activities in the world that don't give them many rewards. Things you've got to do and there doesn't seem to be much reward or much difference when they're done. But this is something different. This really does make a difference. The rewards of the practice are immense. And one of the functions of mindfulness is to keep reminding yourself of that fact. So you should give only your best when it comes to the practice. As for other activities in life, it's useful to have at least one other activity that you also give your best to as well, to keep, keep the habit going. For the monks, this is easier. We have more time. I remember when John Fuang was first telling me about his time with the John Mun. It seemed like the John Mun was obsessed with the tiniest details. But that was because one, as a meditating monk, you have the time. And two, it's an important part of the practice. You develop your habits in little things you do. Even the rags that were used to wipe wipe your feet as you went up under his hut. Every time they got a little hole, he'd, so, he'd sew them up. He took care of everything. Now for lay people with more things pushing in on you, you can't have that kind of attention to detail in everything. But it's good to have at least one thing in addition to the meditation, where you tell yourself, I'm going to do this really well. So it becomes a habit in the mind. And then the habit can then get transferred over into meditation. Think of your hour here as a meditator, focusing on the breath as a time to show your craft in staying with the breath. So you come out from the hour, you have a sense of, okay, I did my best. Because this is one of those areas where only the best will do. The state of your mind, your ability to put up with hardship, the ability to talk yourself out of all the mind's ignorant foolishness, which is what it is, the foolish ways we make suffering for ourselves. It's going to become more and more crucial as aging comes, as illness comes, as death comes, and you have less and less other things to depend on. There will always be that point where the doctors have to give up. They, they do everything they can. Let's assume you've got really good doctors. They don't do everything they can, but they, they can do only so much. At that point, you're on your own. So what will you have when you're on your own? That'll be a time when you really want your best. So do what you can to give your best right now. 